Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We love you. Dat zijn we dankbaar voor alle kijkers van Hour of Power. En dat is juist de kracht van mijn geloof. God will do incredible things in your life. Van harte welkom bij Hour of Power en fijn dat uh, jullie allemaal weer kijken. We hebben een heel mooi zomerseizoen achter de rug met fantastische programma's. Weet je wat ik leuk vond? Ik uh, was op reis door Europa en ik kwam allemaal mensen tegen die op hun vakantiebestemming naar Hour of Power hebben gekeken. Nou, nu we allemaal weer een beetje thuis zijn, starten we een nieuwe serie programma's. En Bobby Schuller ook met een nieuwe prekenserie en die is getiteld Een Sterk Geloof. En vraagt Bobby zich af... Dat moeten we allemaal doen. Wat doen we nou als we sterk geloof hebben? Komt dat in actie? Veel muziek, zoals altijd in Shepherd's Grove. De twee zingende broer Preston en Princeton Parker zingen een geweldig lied. En als gast heb ik Lise Roest. En Lise, jij hebt een uitspraak die ik heel leuk vind. Daar moet je straks meer over vertellen. Over schaduwkind en zonnekind. Nou, het zonnetje schijnt buiten. Wat ben jij? Een schaduwkind of een zonnekind of alle twee? Ik ben ze allebei, Jan. Okay. Ja. En wat denk je dat ik ben? Ik weet zeker dat je ze allebei hebt. Oh, ja. ik dacht dat ik een zonnekind was. Ja, sorry. Nou, dat zullen heel veel mensen denken. Daar gaan we <laughs> lekker over doorpraten. Welkom bij Hour of Power. the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. And a very warm welcome to you. We are so happy you're here. You know, we do not care what your singing voice sounds like. Worship with us today with all of your heart and out loud. There is power in unified worship. We love you. Thank you for being here. Yeah. And even you just got a rap, that's good enough for us, right? Fine. Uh, Bob Dylan. It. Joyful, joyful, we adore you. Go for it. Okay, let's pray. <laughs> we thank you, Lord. We're grateful that your Holy Spirit is here. Thank you, God, that you move us in the direction of life, a provision of health, of goodness. Thank you, God, that you only will what is good for us and not what is evil, and you've forgiven us and you love us. We thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you, and so do I.
Would you open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians 1, 18 and 25? For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sarah Haggerty is a speaker and best-selling author who penned the popular Adoration series. Through her books, she's found herself to be a voice of hope to many facing challenges in their lives. Her new book, The Gift of Limitations, Finding Beauty in Your Boundaries, invites readers to embrace their limits and see that maybe the things we view as our greatest weaknesses could be used in the most unexpected ways. Please welcome Sarah Haggerty. Sarah, hi, what a privilege to be with you this morning and uh, welcome, we're so glad you're here. Thank you, I'm so glad to be here. Hey, I wanna, you know, a lot of people are familiar with your adoration series and other stuff that you've done and um, I wanna talk about your, before we get your new book, tell me a little bit about your faith journey for those who aren't familiar with you and kind of your background. Well, I have been a believer for a long time. Uh, I experienced some of my first hiccups in my faith in my life in my 20s when my husband and I walked through an extended period of infertility, 13 plus years. Uh, during that time, we adopted uh, two kids from Ethiopia and then two more from Uganda and then had a bunch of surprise miracle pregnancies. So it's been a pretty much an up and down road with God. <laughs> I know a lot of people don't understand how infertility can be so painful, especially for, for couples, but especially for the female. And uh, we've had family members and others. Debilitating even, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's really a strange thing. Um, let's talk about your book, The Gift of Limitations. Uh, so what, what inspired you to write this book? Well, as I said, I think early in my 20s when everybody else was experiencing these rites of passage into motherhood and growing their family and, and their rite of passage was a do not enter sign for me. It was the first time that I started to realize you can't just will yourself into the type of life that you think that you're going to have in God, that circumstances, you can't make certain circumstances happen. Mm -hmm. And then after growing my family, I started to see, you know, even as my family grew, I was experiencing limitations in my health. Um, in even having a big family, big full family life that I could not make myself get out of. And so I started to ask the question, who is God when there's a bent, a fence, a boundary line around my life that is not moving? And I started to see he's right here and he has something for me in these limitations that I resent. Yeah. And, and so, so you talked about the gift of limitations. How is it, how are those limitations in, in a practical way, how is that a gift? I think that's the thing. That's maybe the irony of the title is I don't think we can just tell ourselves, see this as a gift and get yeah. over it. Yeah. What I write about in the book is that there really is a process that all of us need to go through in terms of naming our limitations. The things that we resent and we try and work around, we spend untold amounts of energy trying to overcome that. And, and everyone, probably everybody watching has some something in their life right now that is just not moving. They're praying, they're interceding, they're fasting, even asking God to move and it's not moving. So in order to see our limitations as a gift, I think we need to name them. We need to give ourselves permission to grieve them. 
and give ourselves space to grieve them. And I think it's in grieving that we then find God come and meet us. And he maybe gives us a different picture of the story that he's written for us than the story we think that we're living. Is there like an example in the Bible where you see this kind of happening where a character or someone has a limitation and they sort of, you know, you see this sort of ex ex expressed in scripture kind of? Well, I mean, I think it's all over the Bible. Practically speaking, I think of Mary, you know, she, what we see now as the salvation of the whole world, she experienced as the loss of people's opinion of her, potentially loss of family relationships, loss of standing in the community. It was a profound limitation and it brought salvation to the entire world. Yeah, that's yeah, really excited that God chose her and, and picked her, it's kind of interesting. And he gave her a story that was so different than the story she probably imagined for her life when she first was engaged. And yet we look at the fruit of that story and we go, her the, her, the limited life she lived, even watching her son and his death brought so much profound life. I prayed for two, three years and it was like every morning circling the floor of my house, praying, God, move this, God, move this, God, move this circumstance. And it was one morning, just a quiet whisper, like, hey, this is about you and me more than this is about this circumstance changing. I think when we come up against our limitations, we have an invitation to notice what's actually happening inside of us. And sometimes these things are actually intended to be limited and God is calling forth a surrender. And sometimes he's saying, keep believing that I can move this mountain. Yeah. It just It's not a one, one size fits all. Hey, if you're watching and you're looking for a book that will really help you when you feel stuck, when you feel like, why is God not answering your prayers? Get a hold of this, The Gift of Limitations by Sarah Haggerty. Sarah, thank you so much. We appreciate you. Thanks so much for having me. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you. No matter how dark things may look in your life, you can hold fast to hope that light is on its way. Press, let's sing this one. Darkness to be all around me, searching for what my eyes cannot see, where to go next, and who can I trust, no one but you, my hope is Jesus, I can see the light, I can see yeah. the light.
Het zijn super vrolijke broers. We hebben ze een aantal keren meegemaakt in Amerika. De drie P's noemen ze altijd. Preston en Princeton Parker. En ze zongen over het licht dat in de duisternis schijnt. Lize, jij bent auteur, je bent coach. Ik noemde het in het begin van het programma al dat jij hebt schaduwkind, zonnekind. En toen dacht ik, ja, ik voel me eigenlijk wel een zonnekind. En zei, je hebt ook schaduw, je bent ook een schaduwkind. Ieder mens heeft uh, een schaduwkind en een zonnekind. Zo beschrijf ik dat in mijn boek en ook aan mijn coachtafel omdat je allemaal kwetsuurders oploopt. Je komt in een gebroken wereld terecht en de een heeft wat meer en minder. Maar als je die in het zicht krijgt, dan zie je de schaduw in je leven. En die gaan niet weg, maar daar mag je ja, een thuis aan geven, een plek voor geven. Het is denk ik heel krachtig als je mag zeggen, maar ik, ik blijf voor mijn schaduwkant zorgen. Daar zorg je voor door liefde te hebben voor jezelf. Door echt jezelf, je, nou ja, stel dat je niet zo'n goede emotionele vader en moeder hebt gehad, dat je dat voor jezelf gaat worden. En dat je dat bij God brengt. Dus, snap je? Dus dat je verantwoording neemt voor wat jij nodig hebt. En ik, ik denk ook zeker in mijn nieuwe boek is het heel belangrijk van te. Niet te veel en niet te weinig. Dat is zo'n ei openen. Want als je te veel aandacht besteedt aan je innerlijk, dan, draag je, dan word je weer egoïstisch. Maar als je te weinig doet, dan verwaarloos je jezelf weer. Dus het is heel belangrijk dat je goed in je vel zit, in balans bent... en dat je daarmee ook weer voor anderen meer kan doen. Laatst dat als uh, in geestelijk perspectief. Dus als je voor jezelf kan zorgen... en God betrekt bij je, bij je, bij je kwetsures, zeg maar... dat Hij voor jou er mag zijn... dat je geliefd kind bent van God... dan kan je dat ook weer meer zijn voor een ander. Ja, maar ik ontmoet zoveel mensen... Hè, want het is het thema van Hour of Power. Je bent geliefd, je bent een geliefd kind ja. van God... Je zegt, kon ik dat maar? Jij bent coach. Ik denk dat je heel veel mensen in je praktijk hebt gehad die zeiden van, kon ik me maar geliefd voelen? Ik voel ja. me afgewezen, ik voel me weggeserveerd, ik ben misbruikt, ik ben, uh, nou, noem maar alles maar op wat het leven zo moeilijk maakt. Wat, wat zeg jij dan? Ontmoet jezelf. Ja, maar Wees het is niet zo makkelijk. Je. Dat is ook heel erg moeilijk. Het is juist heel erg moeilijk. Dus, dus als je daar tijd voor neemt, dan kun je verbinden met je pijn en dan kun je je eigen kwetsuurders aankijken. Maar als je daar geen tijd voor neemt en aan voorbij loopt, dan verwaarloos je jezelf. Doen we dat niet heel vaak, aan de pijn uh, voorbij lopen en dingen onderdrukken? Ja, heel veel. Heb jij geleerd om dat niet te doen? Ja. Om ze in de ogen te kijken? Maar dat is ook uh, vanuit een dieptepunt. Omdat ik stil werd gezet door een burn-out, dan moet je wel... Dus dan kun je zo ver doorgaan totdat je lichaam spreekt en zegt van, ja. volgens mij is er wat Waarom nodig. Waarom kreeg je geen burn-out? Omdat ik niet had geleerd om voor mezelf te zorgen. Hè? Dus mijn zelf, mijn emotionele kant, maar ook mijn lichamelijke, fysieke kant ook gewoon te negeren. Ja. Die burn-out had wat te maken met, want je hebt een vreselijk ongeluk meegemaakt. Dat was een optelling, hè? dus ook dat ongeluk was daar onderdeel van. Zeker wat gebeurde, wel. Hè? Ik was op vakantie met uh, twee vriendinnen. Ik was de jongste van drie. Met mijn autootje op Ameland. En uh, we gingen naar de kerk. En aan, uh, op het fietspad zag ik wel een man aankomen. Maar hij zag mij en ons niet. En wij reden op de Provinciale Weg. En hij was verlamd aan één kant. En hij dacht, iedereen is naar de kerk. Op het eiland. Dus hij keek ook niet of er iemand aankwam. Dus ik kon het nooit meer voorkomen. Hij stak zo over. Hij kwam op mij naar voren terecht, dus hij kwam zo'n beetje naar binnen. En daarna werd hij uh, ja, gelanceerd, hè? want dat gebeurt er dan op die snelheid. Ja. Ja. Wat gaat dan door je heen? Ja, dat, dat kun je gewoon niet verwoorden, denk ik. Nee, dat, dan, dan ben je gewoon een soort bevroren. Ja. Ja. Heftig afloop. En ja, ik zie vaak dat het leven een optelsom is van dingen die je meemaakt, die je meedraagt, die je meetorst, die je meezult. Ja. Hey, ik heb jou nu een aantal keren horen zeggen, ja, maar dan moet je van bevrijd worden. Yes, en ja. ik zie het ook wel een beetje bij mezelf, dat die kant, dat het moeilijk is om jezelf ermee of anderen mee te confronteren. Dus help me nog eens even uh, hoe, om, hoe dat te doen. Het zou het mooiste zijn als je dat al doet voordat je last krijgt van klachten. Maar dat, dat zijn we niet gewend, hè? in Nederland zeker niet. Um, wat je kan doen is tijd nemen voor jezelf. Ja. Dus, en, en hulp vragen. En uh, vooruit uh, komen dat je ergens moeilijk uh, moeite mee hebt. Ja, maar ik heb wel een beetje als... Ik denk altijd als, uh, als ik relax, dan voel ik me schuldig. Want dan denk ik, ja, ik doe niks. Ik moet wat doen. Ja. 
Nou ja, dat hoort. Dat is ook. Het is eigenlijk ja, een training die je aan jezelf. Ik vertel veel te veel over mezelf. Het is alsof ik mee in de praktijk zit. Ja. <laughs> Wat je wil, Jan. Ja. <laughs> je hebt twee boeken geschreven: één over Jozef en recentelijk één over Mozes. Uh, waarom Jozef? Omdat Jozef die weet wat het is om alleen te staan en om verdriet mee te maken. En ook zeg maar eens even in één minuut wie Jozef was, voor de mensen die niet zoveel bijbelse kennis hebben. Jozef was een zeer geliefd kind van uh, zijn vader. En uh, daardoor waren ook zijn andere broers heel erg jaloers op hem. En uh, die verstoten hem eigenlijk. En dus hij ging uh, naar Egypte toe. En na jaren van, uh, van onderdrukking kwam hij ook weer tevoorschijn. En kwamen zelfs zijn broers weer tot hem. En kwam er weer verbinding en ja. herstel. Ja. Ja. Wat ik mooi vind van Jozef, dat hij kon vergeven. Mm. Want zijn broers gooiden hem voor dood in een put. Ja. En hij ging naar pa toe en zei dat hij is opgeveten door wilde beesten. Ja. Vader ja. met enorm veel verdriet en dan komt die hereniging weer. Mm-hmm. Jij hebt in je boek zeven sleutels naar aanleiding van het leven van Jozef beschreven. Mm-hmm. Uh, je kunt ze alle zeven noemen of twee. Vergeving is de eerste en de tweede is nederigheid. Hij had een school van nederigheid, hè? dus hij is uh, steeds onrecht kwam, uh, overkwam hem. En in dat onrecht had hij een levenshouding van altijd weer dienend, altijd weer zorgend, altijd weer vrede. Hè? Dus hij had weinig weerstand in die zin. En we weten niet alles van Jozef, maar dat, dat ziet hem wel. En daar kwam hij wel ver mee, zeg maar. Ook al moest hij weer wachten en weer teleurstelling, hij bleef gewoon positief. Hij bleef gewoon vertrouwen eigenlijk. Ja. Op wie? Op God. Ja, doe jij ja? dat ook? Zeker weten, ja. ja. Dat is wel mijn houvast. Hoe heb je ja. dat geleerd? Dat heb ik geleerd van mijn moeder. Ja. Oh, wat mooi. Ja, dat is mijn erfenis, zeg ik altijd, Jan. Ja, ja. Ja. Want wat was jouw moeder voor je? Ik heb mijn moeder heel uh, slecht gekend, zeg maar. Ze is overleden toen ik acht jaar was. Jo. Ja. Maar wat ze achterliet, zeg maar, het ziekbed, heb, weet ik heel goed nog. En vooral haar blijmoedige geloof dat ze niet bang was om te sterven. Ja, dat doet iets met je als kind. Ja. 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 Dat ben je nog maar acht jaar. Ja. Ja. Ik ga naar jouw nieuwste boek, dat is net verschenen. Dat heet Het Goud in de Woestijn. Dat ja. gaat over Mozes. Mozes als de wegwijzer. Goud in de woestijn, dat vind je niet zo makkelijk. Wel een hoop stenen, maar waarom goud in de woestijn? Het slogan in Van Mijn Leven is Jan, God maakt van fout goud. En dat is naar aanleiding van de tekst waar ik door, tot geloof kwam, hè? Romeinen 8, vers 28, hè? als alle dingen medewerken ten goede. Ja, dat God maakt van fout goud. Dat is zoiets moois dat je het om kan draaien en dan iets goeds uit kan uh, halen en weer mee verder kan. Dat is dat goud. Ja. Lees die tekst eens voor. Het Romeinen 8. En wij weten dat voor wie God lief hebben, voor wie volgens zijn voornemen geroepen zijn... Alles bijdraagt aan het goede. Een hele diepe tekst, hè? Ja. Want ook alles wat je overkomt, wat niet goed is. Klopt. En ik, toen ik deze tekst kreeg en hoorde... een half jaar later maakte ik dat ongeluk mee. Dat is niet bepaald goed. Ik heb het niet kunnen voorkomen, ja. maar dan denk je echt... waar is God nu? En toch heb ik me aan deze tekst vastgehouden. Ja. U heeft het gezegd. Ik zie er helemaal niks van. Maar toch geloof ik dat u er iets goeds mee wil doen of wat dan ook. Want waar moet ik me anders aan vasthouden ja. als je zo in de put zit? Ja. Fout en bodem. goud. Hij maakt van fout goud. Ja. Dus daarmee zeg je iedereen die laat ik zeggen, de meest vreselijke dingen heeft gedaan. Een fout leven heeft geleid. Dat kan God veranderen in goud. Absoluut. Hoe doet hij dat? Als je kijkt van wat je niet zelf hebt, wat je niet van jezelf hebt, maar wel weet van God heeft het wel voor jou, dan kun je naar hem toe gaan. Als je daar tijd voor neemt, net zoals je tijd neemt voor je eigen uh, kwetsures, is er ook een God die tijd vraagt van zoek mij. En ja, dan is hij er in zijn woord, want zo heb ik het zelf ook gevonden. Ja. En hij was er toen ook al, toen Mozes... Uh, het volk uit de woestijn leiden. Yeah. Even tussendoor, ik heb net 
die fantastische film, jij hebt hem ook gezien, op Netflix gezien, over het ja, leven ja, van Moses. Ja, ja. Die is dicht bij de Bijbel, dicht bij de waarheid. Ik vond het een hele mooie film. Zeker, ja. Want vertel jij nog eens even in een paar woorden, wie was Mozes? Mozes was een van de jongetjes die uh, de Nijl, voor de Nijl was uh, bedoeld. Ze moest gedood worden volgens het plan van Farao. Is uh, gered door de prinses, is opgegroeid bij het Egyptische Rijk. En totdat het ook ging kriebelen en ging, uh, ja, hij ging het ook voelen. Hè, van wie ben ik nou eigenlijk? En hij was midden in zijn worsteling. In het proces van hoe kan ik nou mijn leven een wending geven. Ja, sloeg hij door hè, en, en sloeg hij iemand dood zelfs. En vluchtte naar de woestijn. En daar begon zijn proces. Daar gaat ook mijn boek over. En na veertig jaar gaat hij weer terug. En dan is hij zover dat hij leiding kan geven om het volk weer uit te leiden. En hoe? Want het volk is wel... Enorm, ja. Is nog steeds in Israël. Ja. Een heel mooi boek. Ik heb er stukken in gelezen. Dank je wel daarvoor. En ik laat je niet met lege handen naar huis gaan. En die zal ik niet gauw vergeten. Zonnekind en schaduwkind. Ik heb een cadeautje voor je. Wow, je bent jong. de eerste die dit krijgt. Oh, wat mooi. Ik zou zeggen, doe hem even om. Kijk ja, even. Ja, mooi. Dankjewel. Ik hou van sieraden, dus je weet waar je mij blij mee maakt. Ja. Kijk, ik prachtig. Ik wil de camera laten zien als je wil. Mooi kruis. Lise, hartelijk dank. En wij gaan luisteren naar het koor van Aver of Power. Dat fantastische koor met dat prachtige orkest. En ze zingen I shall not want. Ik heb niets nodig, behalve hem.
There were two pottery classes. A professor performs an experiment. This is published in uh, Art and Fear by David Bayliss. This pottery professor wanted to see what makes great pottery. Is it volume or is it study? And so he had two classes. And the, the job of the first class, he told them, here's what I want you to do. You're going to be graded on one piece of pottery. And the better it is, the higher your grade. The second class, who didn't know about the first class, said, you're going to be graded on the volume of pots you make. They don't have to be amazing. You just need to make as many pots as you can, and I'll grade you based on that. Now, he thought at the end of the year, this, the class that focused on making a great pot would make the best pot, but the opposite happened. He found that not only did the second class have the most pots, but their best pots were a million times better than the one pot created by the first class. Isn't that an interesting parable for life? Here's what we learn from that story. Action, practice, doing makes the difference. Doing makes the difference. Yes, we plan. Yes, we visualize. Yes, we write our goals down. Yes, we learn. Yes, we grow. But unless you take action, none of that other stuff matters. We're going to talk about this today. Here is the number one reason why people don't get breakthrough in life. Here's the number one reason why people full of potential, why people who are educated, why people who are intelligent and optimistic, people who are well-connected and healthy, people who are smart and positive still don't get a breakthrough. It's because they don't take action. That's the reason. They talk about the idea, they plan, they design, they budget, they visualize, but they never go. And the reason is action comes from faith. And so today we want to talk about how faith comes from hope and how that faith, a godly kind of Bible faith, creates action inside of us. And my hope is today you're going to leave here changed. You're going to leave here different. And if you're watching on YouTube or on television, I want to encourage you to listen to this whole sermon. And I promise you by the end, you're going to be ready to make a difference in your life. You're going to get the breakthrough you're hoping for. Let's begin by turning to the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent. That's hard to say. I will frustrate And then jump down to verse uh, 25. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one can boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. I love this passage because it talks about how when you're sort of connected to God's wisdom, it looks like you're a dummy to everybody else. You look like somebody worthy of ridicule until you get the victory. He talks, Paul, when he's writing this letter to the church, he's like, I know some of you have had an amazing impact. Some of you are famous. Some of you have changed the world. But all of you, and this is a big deal in the Roman Empire, all of you came from, from nothing. Let me ask you here in the house a question. Who has heard of the name Tiberius Claudius Germanicus? Raise your hand by a show of hands. And if you're here, just here in the first service, doesn't count. <laughs> Tiberius Claudius Maximus. Sorry, Tiberius Claudius Germanicus. Any? I saw about four hands. That's pretty good. There's going to be an essay, Jen. Well, you were in the first service too. You're lying. <laughs> All right, look, by a show of hands, 
second question, how many of you have heard of St. Peter? Oh, everyone, huh? A lot of people. Now, here's what's interesting about that. Tiberius, Claudius, Germanicus, his title was Caesar. But if you had said, do you know the name Tiberius, I can't even remember, Claudius, Germanicus, <laughs> to someone in 54 AD when this letter was written, everybody would look at you and laugh. It would be like, it would be the same as if Taylor Swift was president or something. <laughs> the most famous person with the most power in the world. Now, St. Peter was from a little part of the world that nobody cared about, Israel, and a little part of Israel nobody cared about in Israel called Galilee. That was where all the immigrants and fishermen were. Peter was up there fishing and he was called, and now today we know he's one of the greatest, most important figures in human history. Even if you're an atheist, you'd have to say that. So isn't it interesting how Paul says, God loves to choose people like an obscure fisherman that is not of noble birth to change the world and to have a cascading effect on history. Isn't that hope for us? Whether you're of noble birth or not, it's not that noble birth is bad. Uh, it is that it doesn't matter. Here's what matters. Do you take action? Do you live by faith? See, God loves to use unqualified people to do impossible things. Amen. And he does it by giving them godly wisdom instead of the world's wisdom. The world's wisdom that, is, that looks like certainty. It's really a false certainty that oftentimes leads to arrogance and people holding onto positions versus, here's what God wants from you, to walk by faith and not by sight. Walk by faith. Now, I know if you're in, in here and you're a smart person, I know you are, you would say, well, Bobby, shouldn't we plan? Isn't it good to know, to have knowledge? Isn't it good to learn? I'd say, absolutely, you know me. But here's a good rule of thumb. Be elite, but not elitist. You see, there's a difference. Do your best. Do all you can. Give all you've got. Touch as many lives as you can. Build as much as you can. Make as much as you can. Love as much as you can. But in the end, remain an empty cup, ready to learn and hear from God. And don't do it in your own power. Do it by the power of the Spirit. Do all you can, but don't rest on your laurels. Do all you can to win, but don't forget to help other people cross the finish line. Look, here's how we solve our problems as believers. We solve it with the Word of God, with the Bible. We, we understand the Bible, the Word of God, and its wisdom, and we let that guide us. And we invite the Holy Spirit, the author of the Bible, to speak to us. So we listen to the Word, and we listen to the Spirit. I know that's not very concrete for a lot of people, but I'm telling you, it is this kind of power that creates action and breakthrough in life. Here's what the Bible says. God's wisdom is foolishness to those who are perishing. The cross is foolishness to those who are peri perishing. When we say, I have no power over my addiction, my sin, my selfishness, all the things that cause me to be, I have no power to fix that on my own. I have to be crucified with Christ and raised from the dead. That's the only way I can be saved. That sounds ridiculous to the world, but it is the only answer to save our world is the cross. When Jesus says, love your enemies, and the world says, get back at your enemies, and dox your enemies, and get them fired, and gossip about them, Jesus tells us to love our enemies. Well, in the world's eyes, that's foolishness. It's foolishness to give when you're in need in the world's eyes, but that's precisely what the scripture tells us. When you're in need, give some of your money away. Or to give grace and not ridicule. And even things like having children and getting married. The world now says, many people in the world think that's foolishness. Not that everybody has to do that, but the, the idea of it being dumb or a waste of time or a waste of money or a waste of a life, not for me. And the biggest one of all is hope. And the hope I'm going to talk about today uh, is not the hope that so many of the world speak of. Here's why. There's two types of hope. Here's the first kind of hope. I call it lazy hope. You know what that looks like. We've all been there before. Gosh, I hope I get some money to pay my rent. I hope I get a raise. I hope my kids know God. I hope I can travel someday. I hope I meet somebody or my relationships improve. I hope my marriage gets better. It's up to him. It's up to her. I hope, I hope, I hope. Not good. 
Here's the second kind, a biblical kind of hope. Uh, and that's what we're talking about today, biblical hope. And this is what biblical hope looks like. It means understanding the ways and promises of God that are written in the Bible. And that hope stirs within us a kind of faith, possibility thinking. It's possible for me. It stirs within us a faith that causes us to take action. Remember, if you want to increase your faith, you don't get it through prayer. You don't get faith through prayer. You don't get faith through worship. Here's how you get faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. If you want to increase your faith, you study the Bible. That's how you increase your faith, and you study it seriously. That's how we increase our faith. And when this happens, when our faith is increased, it leads to real action. When faith is increased, action is increased. The proof is in the pudding. This is what happens when you have the kind of hope I'm talking about that's based on the Word of God. It means that you go before you have all the answers. You're going to have some answers, but not all of them. And that's just the way things are. My grandpa Schuler built a whole ministry on this principle. The kind of risks he took without having answers blew my mind when I look back. In, uh, when you're at war, there's this thing called the fog of war, where you know you have to take action, but you don't really know what's out there. You know how to be prepared. You have an idea of what might be out there. But all you know is if we stay here, we're going to die. We have to get out there. And it's a scary thing to do. And life is like that. Life is full of a fog of war. But here's one thing we know. If we stay here, it's not going to go well. If we stay here and hope things go well, it won't go well. Yes, you have some time to prepare, to plan, to cast a vision, to get some direction. But the direction is forward. It's not here. You have to go. You have to do something. Jesus gives his disciples this little experiment that I love and return to often. He tells them to go. And when he says go, he tells them, I'm going to send you out there to perform miracles and do amazing things, but don't bring any food. Don't bring any baggage or luggage. Don't even bring money. Don't, bring, don't even bring like a carry-on. He doesn't say that, but... You get, it, you get the, just bring nothing except what you, what you got on your back and go and just watch. You're not going to need anything. And that's precisely what happens. They go out there and they perform miracles and they have a, authority over spirits and that just this incredible thing happens. And they come back and, they, and he says, were you ever in need? And they said, never. We were never in need. And this is the interesting thing about living in God's kingdom is when he says go, he wants you to trust that he'll make a way when you need a way. And he will. And he always has. This is, the, this is foolish, foolishness to the world, right? This is foolishness to the world, especially to the elites. We're surrounded by elites constantly. We grow up with elites. You might work for an elite. Elites love the status quo. They love the groupthink of the upper echelon. When a question is raised, an elite answers, what does the guild think? And because of this, the elites who seem like they have all the power actually are slow, they're lazy, and they are in love with committees. And because of this, if you're not an elite, you have the biggest advantage of all, which is you are the most free to take action, to go and to do, and it will drive them crazy. It just will drive them crazy. Can I get an amen from goers and doers in the house? Go before you're prepared. Thank you for that amen. We got, a, we got a winner in the house. Go before you're prepared. Once you have a plan, once you have a vision, act. Act. Do. Go. Here's biblical hope. Biblical hope says something like this. If I keep stepping out in faith, God will respond. Remember what Corey Ten Boom said? If you have the faith, God has the power. Here's what the Bible says. God says to you, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. Well, that doesn't seem fair. Shouldn't God do the drawing? Well, sometimes he does. But sometimes he wants you to do the drawing. What do you do with that when the Bible says, you draw near to me? and I'll draw near to you. Why would God want it that way? Why? 
because God responds to action. Action is faith personified. Think of all the examples in the scripture that connect action with faith. Why would Jesus say, pick up your mat and walk? when he, would, he could just heal the man? Why would he say, clean the mud from your eyes on the Sabbath to the man who is blind? And why would he say to the uh, lepers, go show yourself to the priests in Jerusalem and on the way they were healed? It's because God responds to action. God responds to action. There's the other side of the ledger too. Notice how the rich young ruler says to Jesus, I believe, I believe, I believe. I believe, I follow, I'm a moral man, I do everything. What must I get to an eternal life? I believe, I believe, what should I do? And he says, go sell everything and give it to the poor. And he says, oh, well, I mean, I believe, but not like, like that. You see? It's the other side, no action. Talk is cheap. Action is a sign of spiritual maturity. When God commanded the Israelites to go into the River Jordan, it wasn't the first time he asked them to cross the body of water. The first time was the Red Sea, but he parted it first. The second time, it's flowing like crazy. And they know if they walk in there and something doesn't happen, they're going to die. But they still walk in with the water flowing before it parts. And they don't know if it's going to part. They don't know if they're going to walk on water. They don't know if they're going to breathe underwater or what's going to happen. They just know God said it, I trust it, and they did it, and it worked. That's the crazy thing that the world hates about Christian faith, it, is that it actually works. That's what will drive them the most crazy, is that you actually win, you actually achieve, you actually do it. My son Cohen has developed this habit that whenever he gets out of the car, he gets, the car door opens, he stands up, turns like this, and like trust falls. And I always catch him. But just imagine if I didn't. In fact, one time I, I open the door, I undo his seatbelt, go back to the stroller to get something, and I see him mid-fall, and I run over and grab him, and he still looks at me and he says, Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> and you know, I just like, here's why, here's why the sun can fall without looking, even if it's dumb. He knows the character of the Father. He knows me. He knows I know him. He knows I'm going to catch him. Is it the best way to do it? Sometimes. Not always. In life, you have plenty of opportunities, but here's what you don't have plenty of. You don't have plenty of time. Can I get an amen from the house? You got plenty of opportunities. You got many times at the plate. You got many shots at the basket. You got many fill in the blank. Well, here's what you don't have. You don't have a lot of time. People act like they only got one crack at it. How many cracks at it do you have? As much as you want. What if I lose, you say? Many of you, you come from a culture, a family culture, a religious culture, a national culture, that says, if you lose big once or twice, that's it for you. You can't do any more. And I say to them, says who? What happens if you just do it anyway? What happens if you just say, no, I'm going to do it a million times? Here's the, you say, what happens if I lose? Here's the danger of winning too early. When you win, you learn nothing. When you win, you learn nothing. So keep losing until you win. What's so bad with that? How else are you going to learn other than by losing, by breaking pots, building pots, messing up? Eventually you'll build enough pots that you'll be an expert. Final story. Maybe you have to act, but you can't decide what to act on. Maybe you have road A and row B. You have door number one and door number two. Which door do you take? I had the same conundrum, actually, when I was trying to decide whether to lead the Crystal Cathedral. And uh, Juan Carlos Ortiz, who was my mentor at the time, a wonderful minister at this church, touched a lot of lives, prayed with me about it. And I asked him for advice. I said, I don't know if I should go to the Crystal Cathedral or if I should just leave that alone, it's a mess, and focus on what's working here in my church plant with my friends, which way should I go? What should I do? And he said, he sounded like Count Chocula because he was from Argentina. God loves you, like this, you know. <laughs> but he, said, he said to me, if you go to the cathedral, God will bless you because he loves you. But if you go and build your local church, God will bless you because he loves you. Here's the lesson. We got to go. We got to go. 
Make a choice. God will bless it because he loves you. God will bless you because he loves you. Take action, my friend. Take action. Your life is yours. You have a lot of tries, but not a lot of time. God will bless you because he loves you. We thank you, Father, that you're here now. And we pray that you'd put something inside of us, a bias for action, a bias to take a step, to take a leap, to move. Thank you, Father, that you've given us all that we have. We love you, we trust you, and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dat was Bobby Schure en uh, net als heel veel kijkers heb ik grote bewondering voor zijn bijbelse toepassing, maar ook zijn praktische tips. En nu vroeg hij zich ook af, als je een sterk geloof hebt, dan moet dat in actie komen. Nou, en als je denkt, wat moet ik dan doen? Dan heb ik een goede tip voor je. De telefoonreceptie van Hour of Power zoekt vrijwilligers, want we krijgen heel veel telefoontjes en onze receptie wordt bemand door een enthousiast team van vrijwilligers. Dus is dat wat voor jou? Is dat wat voor u? Een paar uur per week of een halve dag? Uh, meld je dan aan als receptionist te of receptionist bij Hour of Power. Een heel leuk team op een mooi kantoor in Baarn. Volgende week is mijn gast Gert-Jan de Jonge. Misschien herinneren we dat verhaal nog wel. Het is vijf jaar geleden gebeurd. Een trouwstoet gaat door Rotterdam. Die maken heel veel kabaal. Ze zitten op de auto, toeteren, houden het verkeer tegen. En een agent zegt, jongens, dit kan echt niet. En die agent wordt van achteren neergeslagen. En dat is Gert-Jan de Jonge. Lang wilde hij niet over praten, maar volgende week in Hour of Power vertelt hij zijn verhaal. Hoe dat zijn leven op een dramatische manier heeft beïnvloed. Maar ook op een nieuwe manier hoop heeft gegeven en zijn geloof vleugels. Volgende week in Hour of Power. Iedereen bedankt voor het kijken. Ontzettend leuk dat jullie uh, weer met ons meeleven. Denk nog even aan uh, de telefooncentrale en uh, een hele goede werkweek toegewenst. Kijk volgende week weer naar Hour of Power. Al onze uitzendingen zijn terug te kijken op hourofpower.nl. Hier vind je ook onze webshop. 
Blijf in contact met ons via social media of mail ons. Wilt u ook dat Hour of Power kan blijven uitzenden? Word dan nu donateur.